forget all of the stories you hear of near-death experiences, forget all of the tales you have heard of heaven and hell, put out of your mind the myth that when you die you will either be met by St. Michael welcoming you through the pearly gates or you will have to spend all eternity choked by the smell of your own burning flesh as you walk naked through endless fields of hellfire. For the past few years I have been suffering from an illness that has baffled doctors across the globe. It all started with an unbearable headache that would come and go at random intervals. Some nights I would wake up with a blood-soaked pillow and a searing pain in the front of my head as blood dripped from my nose. I went to see my doctor and he was stumped. He prescribed me codeine for the headaches, but even when I doubled or sometimes tripled the dosage, the headaches would remain. After a few months of this, I began to get progressively worse. The nosebleeds would start during the day, accompanied by a shooting pain that would travel up through my nasal passage and around to my ears. Within six months, I would occasionally lose my sense of smell, hearing and sight. The doctors concluded that my brain was in some way attacking itself but they still couldn't work out what the exact cause was or how to help me. They said that I would be dead within 12 months, and they were right. Little did they know, I wouldn't stay dead. I have died a total of six times, each time for just a little bit longer before they managed to resuscitate me, Each time I come back with a clearer image of what awaits, each time I wake up screaming until I lose my voice. What does await us on the other side isn't eternal flames, nor is there a set of golden gates and angels in the distance. You don't stand hand in hand with family members past, but You don't spend the rest of time being eaten from the inside out by maggots while your skin melts and bones turn to ash. You won't meet God, nor the devil, angels nor demons. What awaits is simply nothing. Six times I have died, and six times I have found myself in total darkness, completely cut off from all of my senses. I was alone in absolute silence. I couldn't feel the ground beneath me or walls around me. That place was completely devoid of any smells and I couldn't even taste the saliva in my mouth. I was left there all alone feeling lost and scared, there was a building feeling of sheer panic, ever growing with no sign of change, and that's all there is. I've been to the other side, I know exactly what awaits us all, and I know it won't be long until I'm back there for all eternity. I never really talk about this experience, as I never felt that many people would believe me if I ever told them the truth. I admit to having hallucinations frequently, and I do admit to hearing voices occasionally, but they were nothing like this. This happened to me about five years ago. Most people don't believe that this is possible but there is some truth to this experience. People sometimes undergo a condition where they fall into a light sleep but end up waking during the phase of sleep where your body freezes itself in place 
and awake in a condition known as sleep paralysis. Many people report experiencing strange phenomena whenever they awake during sleep paralysis, and I was no different. During a night where I had very little sleep, I woke up for some reason but was incapable of movement. It was the first time I had ever woken up during sleep paralysis, but it was an experience I surely wouldn't forget. At the foot of my bed was a large, dark humanoid figure. Its eyes were a piercing metallic red. Its face looked like a rotten and mistreated stuffed animal with razor-sharp teeth. Its body was the color of pure darkness and reflected the light that seeped in through my window. In its left hand, it held a large cleaver. Slowly, a wide smile spread across its hideous face. The figure floated over towards me, its feet never touching the ground. Its grisly maw opened slowly, mouthing out the words it had for me carefully. Its voice was cold and metallic, almost like the sound of shredding sheet metal. Don't move. As much as I wanted to flee or cower in fear, I was incapable of movement. I was even incapable of tears. I wanted to cry out to someone, anyone for help, but I could only make out mere whispers. My eyes, however, were fully capable of movement and could clearly see the monster that loomed over me. It lowered its face within just a few inches of mine and had its arm raised with a cleaver in hand above my head. I wanted to be anywhere, even in the pits of hell, just so I would be free of the suspense of having this hideous entity hovering over me. It spoke to me again. Come to three. I closed my eyes and slowly began to count up to three. I could feel the breath of the figure above my forehead, warm and moist. I sounded off the first number. One. I readied myself to say two, but I felt the figure's breath coming closer. I wanted anything but to lay in my bed powerless to this being. Two. I cried out to the monster and felt it grow even closer. I opened one of my eyes and gazed deeply into the soulless stare of the entity that was poised on taking my life. Its open maw was close enough to sink its jagged teeth into my face. It grew impatient, waiting on its skill and commanded me to continue. Do it! It shouted as I closed my eyes again in fear. I spoke aloud once more. Three! I waited in my bed for five long minutes, hoping that it had already killed me and that the suspense was over. It didn't matter to me whether I was in heaven or hell, just as long as it was over. Surprisingly to me that night, it was neither. After I opened my eyes, I realized that I was not dead and that I was fully capable of movement again. I never experienced something like that ever since that night, and that night was one of the last nights I ever had a dream, nightmare or horrific occurrence such as that. Since then, I have come to the conclusion for myself 
that the figure was likely a hallucination made up by my own mind. Some may say it was a ghost or a demon, and I won't deny their claims, but I can't accept them as a fact. No matter what it was I saw that night, I hope I never see it again. I hate going to sleep in my room. It always watches me from my closet, and it always talks to me. The first occurrence was when I was six years old. I remember laying in my bed, about to go to sleep, when I heard shuffling in my closet. At that age, I only assumed the worst. And I was right. All I heard for ten minutes straight was that shuffling in the night-lit and silent room. Then, suddenly, the shuffling stopped. I remember only hearing the sound of my heart pounding as I lie there, frozen with fear. Do you want to be friends? A crude whisper from my closet said. I slowly creaked my head to where my closet was and saw one wide open eye looking at me intensely from inside the cracked opening of my closet door. I instantly screamed for my mother. Then suddenly I heard the thing in my closet go, oh shit, followed by new aggressive shuffling. There were also noises that the thing made that didn't seem familiar to anything I've ever heard in my closet before. It sounded almost industrial. Moments later, my mother burst through the door. Are you okay, sweetie? She said with worry as she held me in her arms. I then explained the situation about the thing in my closet. There's a monster with big eyes in my closet and it wants to be my friend, I exclaimed while sobbing. And it says curse words too. My mother's face went calm and she gave a sigh of relief. You don't need to scare me like that. I thought you were hurt, she said. It was just a bad dream, sweetie. You need to get some sleep. Before she walked out my door, I asked her if she could check my closet for assurance. She walked over to the closet door, turned the knob and opened it, and nothing. The same stuff as before and as it was left. No one was in there. See? Nothing is in your closet, she reassured me. Now get some rest, because we've got a big day tomorrow. She walked over to me, tucked me back into the bed, gave me a kiss and turned my light off before walking out and closing the door. I didn't see or hear the monster for the rest of the night. The next occurrence happened when I was 10. Right before I went to bed, me and my mother were discussing my father and my big brother. They both died when I was a baby, so I really didn't have any fond memories of them. That void does weigh on my heart, though. My mother explained that they died in a car accident and told me stories of how my father would come home from work every day and sit down on the floor to play with me and my brother. It almost made me cry every time she would tell me stories of my brother and father. She soon signaled me to go to bed. I gave her one last hug and kiss before marching up to my room. As I was laying in bed about to doze off, I heard a sound that shook my nerves to its very core. It was that shuffling again. This time, the thing in my closet didn't hesitate to speak to me. 
So you don't want to be friends? I see how it is, said the Nellie's raspy voice. I was panicked just like the first time, but instead of screaming for my mother, I wanted to get out of that room. I leaped up from my bed and made for the bedroom door. However, as soon as I got to the doorknob, the monster screamed, Get back in your bed or I'll cut your eyes out! I stopped for a split moment to consider the monster's warning, but I wasn't staying in there any longer with that thing. When I got downstairs, all I could think about was running to my mother's arms, but I knew she wouldn't believe me. From then until I moved out, I slept on the couch. I had occasional nightmares about the monster in my closet that made me develop insomnia. I lost touch with my mother a couple of years ago, but one of the last things she told me was that she moved out of that house we lived in. Last year, I decided that I needed to put my demons to rest. I've had too many restless nights and it was starting to affect my job and college, so I went to visit the house. After settling things with the real estate, I was able to get inside. I walked up to my old room and there it was. I was trembling with fear, imagining a grotesque being jumping out at me once I got too close but I quickly pushed that thought out of my mind and pushed on. I slowly started to open the closet door and then flung it open in anticipation. And like before, nothing. Even all my old clothes were gone, except one, a jacket on the floor. I moved the jacket and, to my surprise, There was a body-sized metal plate under it. I moved the plate and, as I expected, there was a hole. I've heard about cases like this, where criminals would hide in secret compartments and tunnels through an occupied residence house. If that's my case, then whoever done this to me was really sadistic. My fear turned into curiosity, and I was ready to put this nightmare to rest. I crawled through the hole and noticed that it was actually a huge air duct. That explained the unusual noises. I kept crawling until I saw the end of the tunnel, which was a wall vent. Eager to see which part of the house my creeper was venturing from, I popped open the vent and crawled out. My face drained in color. It was my mother's room. How could she do this to me? I softly said as I slowly walked forward, traumatized. I then nudged a piece of bowed-up floor accidentally. Numb in emotion, I lifted the wooden board up. There were three coffins in the floor. A normal-sized one, a small one, and one more that was the size of a ten-year-old. I was better off thinking it was a monster. I don't know how this nightmare began. I'm stuck standing up in a small enclosed glass box with shackles on my feet to keep me in place. I can't see anything except a small shimmering light above me. I can hear people asking me questions. I don't know why I don't have any answers. I've told them this many times, but they won't believe me. They tell me I'm going to drown if I don't comply. I know their threats are for real, but I just don't have the words that would appease them. 
I feel a warm liquid start dripping in from the ceiling of my glass prison. It slowly covers my feet and rises up to my knees as the questions get louder. My answers are muffled with tears as I plead to them that I do not know. My cries fall to deaf ears as the liquid keeps dropping till it's to my chest. I begin to hyperventilate as I know what is going to happen. I'm going to die a painful death by drowning. They shriek at me their final warnings and as I'm still unable to provide them with acceptable answers, they pour more liquid in. My heart beats faster and louder as my fists batter the unmoving glass. I can feel how the water level slowly rises up to my nose as I desperately gasp for my last bits of air. I try to jump and struggle, but the shackles at my feet keep me firmly in place. Till there's no escape from it, my head goes under. I hold my breath as valiantly as I can, but at some point it's just too much as the water starts filling my lungs. The torment is excruciating as my lungs get filled with warm pain and misery that radiates throughout my body. I can feel myself becoming faint as my life flashes before my eyes. It is such a cliché, but those last few moments before certain death feel like hours painful, prolonged, torturous hours before finally falling into blissful unconsciousness. And then I find myself back in the glass box, with it empty of liquids and with people asking me questions again, threatening to drown me if I don't answer. I know they mean it with all of their heart, but I still don't have the answers they seek. The summer between senior year of high school and freshman year of college is when most people go on life-changing trips with their best friends or with their families, volunteering for some association or just preparing to leave the nest. For me, it was the summer when I discovered that monsters are real. I was living back in Arkansas with my mother, father and grandpa in our big farm. Well, it was big to me. I grew up playing in the fields with Katie, my German shepherd, exploring the surrounding woods, or just petting the sheep and chickens, even though mom always said I shouldn't treat them as pets because I knew they were eventually gonna be butchered. But I secretly gave each one a name anyway. That was why I was so sad when the coyotes got a hold of us and started eating our hands. At first, it was just three, four every other week, but one morning I woke up at the stroke of dawn and was unable to fall back asleep, so I decided I was gonna take advantage of the pleasant weather to take a walk in the woods with Katie before the sun made the air still and humid to the point it was suffocating. Maybe I could have checked out the old abandoned house once more. I was always intimidated by it, as if I felt bad vibes coming from the crumbling two-story building. And as a child, I challenged myself to go inside and explore it, although there wasn't anything worth noticing besides some usual teenager graffiti on the walls and a stone table in the middle of what I assumed was the dining room. And yet, I always ran out of it after mere minutes. At one point, I just avoided that part of the woods, but 
now I was almost an adult and maybe I would have just laughed at my silly fears. All of that became irrelevant the moment I stepped outside and saw the carnage on our front yard. Half a dozen chickens, maybe more, were randomly scattered on the ground, mauled, half-eaten, each in a pool of blood that soaked the earth. White feathers adorned the scene in a brutal contrast of colors. I guess I screamed at the top of my lungs, because after a few minutes, that could have been seconds or hours since I felt frozen in shock at the crude scene, my mom and grandpa came running out of the house. Mom tried to turn me around and push me back inside, telling me not to look, as if the image wasn't already burned in my memory, while grandpa was loading his rifle, yelling, damn coyotes! It was in vain, as the blood was already dry and any coyotes were for sure long gone. I spent the day changing channels on the TV, not even paying attention to what was on, nothing interesting, that's for sure, and I overheard Dad and Grandpa in the kitchen discussing about our coyotes problem. Grandpa wanted to set up more traps and install a fence. Dad said the traps were clearly useless and a fence would have costed too much. He wanted to stay up with the rifle and wait for them. I went to my room with a moping Katie, clearly upset by my disconsolate mood, so I don't know what they agreed on, but clearly their plan failed once more. I woke up to screams, angry ones, and doors shuffling. I tried to run out, but mom caught me before I could fling the door open and just told me, it's Nelly. Nelly was my favorite sheep. I assisted mom during the labor when she was born. I saw her grow up. My eyes filled with tears and mom hugged me. We'll get them, she told me, softly speaking against my hair, but I could hear in her voice that we both knew it was a lie. Dad and Grandpa spent the day setting traps every ten feet on the edge of the crops and woods, and after dinner I went to my room and watched a movie on my tablet, while they were sitting outside, rifles in hand, determined to put an end to all this. We were barely breaking even, and we couldn't afford to keep losing livestock, and none of the farms in a 10 mile radius were as badly attacked as we were, so they kinda took it personally. I had fallen asleep sometime during the movie, and was jolted awake by a gunshot outside. I jumped off the bed and heard my grandpa yelling, Mark! I froze. I knew what was happening, my dad was going after them, in total darkness. I almost bumped into my mother running out of my room, and once we got outside, our fear was confirmed. With only a hunting rifle and no flashlight, my dad had dived into the woods after they heard movements in the trees coming closer. Grandpa was the one who shot in the air to scare them off, But Dad was so furious, he wanted all of them dead. After the longest hour of my life, we decided to call the sheriff and explain the situation. She arrived about 40 minutes later, but said there was nothing she could do, as we didn't know if my dad was simply chasing the coyotes or not, and that we had to wait for daylight. She was positive he was coming back at any moment. Mom was afraid that he had injured himself in the darkness or got lost in the woods, while Grandpa tried to console her and reminded her that he was a strong man. I just intensively stared at my cup of tea, feeling a knot in my stomach, as if I could foresee something bad. Daylight came, and no sign of my dad. 
the sheriff had called over some officers and they spread out in the woods calling for my dad. Mom tried to stop me, but there was no way. I was just gonna stay there without doing anything any longer, so I too ventured in the woods. That time I didn't bring Katie, as I was afraid for her. I walked for a good 30 minutes, hearing in the distance the officers calling out my dad's name, and only when I saw it I realized where I had gone the old abandoned house. The feeling of dread intensified, but I wasn't able to determine whether it was the house itself or something more, something unexplainable. With shaking hands, I quietly tiptoed inside, and when I entered the living room, I just stood there, staring, unable to believe what I was seeing unable to accept what my own eyes were looking at. I turned around and started running faster than I had ever run before, survival mode kicking in. I knew better than to blindly run in the woods, but in that moment nothing made sense. Tears were straining my cheeks and a deafening ring in my ears cut me out from reality so I barely realized I had tripped on something, likely a fallen branch or the root of a tree, but I saw the pointy rock that looked like it was coming to me in slow motion. After that, only darkness. When I woke up, I was in the hospital. I had been unconscious for three days, had concussion, the doctor explained. I had a thick layer of bandages wrapped around my head, and my right eye was stained yellow and puffy as I hit my cheekbone and got a black eye. As soon as the doctor left the room, my mother approached the bed and took my hand. She was shaking and crying and barely managed to whisper, They found dead, honey, in the creek. They think he fell inside and hit his head, and then the coyotes got to him. I nodded, unable to say anything else. I was discharged a couple of weeks later, attended my dad's funeral, and in September moved to Boston for college. I've never told anyone what happened that day. It's best for everyone if they think that's how things went. But I will never forget seeing my father, his head smashed in, opened up like a piece of meat, lying on that stone table as a bunch of hooded figures surrounded him and bit into his raw flesh before noticing me and turning to look at me in silence, their faces hidden in the hoods, blood pouring down the table, along their hands, staining the concrete floor. After that day, we never lost any livestock again. The coyotes didn't come back. Only, I know, they weren't coyotes. It's in the dustiest books that you may find the best stories.